Welcome to Bollywood Talent Club. Today we are starting a new series called Reflections. Many of us received our academic education back in India, while a major portion of the careers, rather professional careers, took place in America. So in Reflections, Bollywood Talent Club members will reflect back on their professional careers in a one-on-one -on -one talk. Today, our guest is Dr. Kushalta Jaikar Ahmed, a long-time Bollywood Talent Club member. Today, she will talk about her career as well as talk about her connection with music. So here is Dr. Kushalta, or Kushalta as she preferred to be called. Before we begin, you might notice, I'm sure you must have noticed also, my movements of my head or neck become excessive on and off. And that's to just let you know it's related to my medications that I'm taking for my neurological condition. And I'll be taking treatment pretty shortly. Okay. So just I wanted to remind you. I may let you know. We totally understand. And on behalf of One Week Talent Club, all the best for the upcoming procedure you're going to go to Boston. And we look forward to having you back very soon. Welcome to Bollywood Talent Club. Thank you. You are a doctor. What made you choose this medical profession? Oh, first of all, that's something that is valued back home because two professions, people either become doctors or engineers. And for women, it was straightforward doctor. But for me, there was a very special reason. That is, I had exposed, I had been exposed to very good physicians. They were family physicians and had taken wonderful care of my family members, particularly my mom and my <coughs> sister. And that impressed me and I essentially be decided in, just before I even went to high school to become a doctor. And there is one more, little more additional reason being that my father wished to have a Dr. Jaker in the family and I took it upon myself to be that. So that's, and I followed it through. Somewhere I understand that you actually wanted to go into mu music as your professional career. <laughs> that's kind of funny thing that I loved music, I loved to sing, and I wanted to study. My father thought, and perhaps rightly so, because I don't remember making up my mind one way or another, but he thought if I started music, I certainly will drop all the books and <laughs> become a singer. How good, I don't care, but I would have. So essentially that's what I'm trying to connect at this late age, a late stage of my career. So later on, <coughs> you're going to sing some songs, so oh dear. our viewers can witness some of your musical talent. Okay, I, I, I'll try because I wasn't pre prepared for that. I thought it was a talk interview, but sure, I will No, try. we would like you to showcase your musical talent. Okay, I'll do that. I'll okay. try. So now you're also a psychiatrist. Any particular interest in choosing this special field? It's kind of a shifting from one to the other to the other. Back home, I would have remained an obstetrician, which is standard thing for women, physician. Um, after coming here, I found out that there was much more than one specialty for women. And I began with pediatrics first. But in pediatrics, I learned about mind of a child rather than just physical problems and that made me realize that becoming a psychiatrist would make me a better doctor, a better pediatrician. I shifted to psychiatry. Once I got into it, I got stuck. I couldn't leave that because I absolutely enjoyed working as a psychiatrist. So that's <coughs> where I am. Excuse me. I understand there are subspecialties in psychiatry. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, there are several. Primarily, there used to be adult and child. 
it's now become it expanded into several special subspecialties. There is one geriatrics, there is a forensic, there is one uh, substance abuse, and I'm sure there are m many more coming up. But this is what they already exist, and these subspecialties. You actually, when you say subspecialty, you actually have to take boards examination to become board certified and that's what I would say that that's when you become subspecialist. <coughs> Sorry, so I'm very much interested to find out where actually you started your career. Did you start in the, where did you start your residency? Oh, we, we came here, see at the time that we came to United States, the physicians, they were, we were asked to come, we were requested to come, we were, some of us even got the fare, the airfare to get here. But, uh, and once you came here, whichever place gives you that sponsorship, you choose. So I started with Westchester and then followed through the other hospitals. For example, by pediatrics I did in Cornell Medical Center, a prestigious center. Um, in New York City and fellowship in child and psychiatry I did in Brooklyn. So basically all my postgraduate training is in New York. So I gather that your uh, career was actually centered on juveniles. Once I chose psychi child psychiatry as my specialty, yes. yes. So there must be some special skills that uh, one requires to treat juveniles? I would say yes. People may not agree because the belief being if you are a physician you should be able to do whatever you are supposed to do. But that's not true. People take specialization where they are, there's a good fit that they can do it right, particularly with pleasure and enjoy and do the right job. And that's basically what <coughs> happens. And I in order to be a child psychiatrist, I believe personally, you must like children. If you don't like children, you can't be treating them. And I do. I happen to like them. And more so, more of the liking ends up being having good time treating them, them trusting me, and therefore, the, once the fit is correct, it really has a very good results. Outcomes are very good. Sounds very interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Before we get into the nitty gritties of the challenges faced by juveniles, now we're going to bring a song by Kushalta. Oh dear. I again I wasn't prepared for it, but let's see if we can try. Um, Thank you. 
nicely done, Kushalta. Now, on a very serious note, what are some of the major problems faced by juveniles that you have been treating? Most serious problems that I dealt with are two, and serious meaning truly serious. One being death and dying, very sick children with cancer that I worked in Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital of Cancer in New York City. And two is the abused children, particularly incest and sexual abuse victims. Those are the two very major, major serious problems I dealt with. And as hard and difficult as it was, the rewards were equally, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to use the proper word for it, that they were extremely ingratiating and helpful for my career. From the way the tone of your voice, it sounds like you thoroughly found your career satisfying in helping the little ones. Yes, sir. Are you still in touch with some of your patients? Oh yeah, that's a nice thing to have. I, I have seen, or my little patients now becoming big guys, no longer patients, when brought by their parents with their graduation caps and gowns to show off that they are now have finished college or finished some, something very, very special. And that was extremely, extremely gratifying experience. So, in other words, you do know that what you do does have very positive outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me. In treating children, is it just the child and the psychiatrist, or does it also bring in school counselors, parents? How does it work? Yes. In a way, that is one of the reasons why people uh, or professionals don't like to do child psychiatry, because child psychiatry in adult psychiatry, you deal with the patient, adult. He comes or she comes, you have to treat, the, to discuss whatever, and that's it. Whereas in case of children, you have to deal with parents, you have to deal with schools, you have to deal with guidance counselors, and you name it. So you really end up spending triple, quadruple amount of time dealing or treating these younger children. And that's one of the problematic things. But yes, you have to do it. Those, by not doing it, we would be really shortchanging the treatment, definitely. There must have been times when you had to prepare children going through court dramas to point a finger at a witness or even getting prepared for a medical treatment. Can you talk about some of those experiences? Yes, yes I can. Uh, how children have their imagination as to what's going on and what to expect. To begin with, I would say, uh, going to the court to prepare as a witness against the perpetrator of sexual abuse. We. Preparation is extremely important because without that, the children will not be able to face the court. This child drew a picture. I asked him to draw a picture of court. The court filled the whole page, and he was at the, co at the corner of a page, tiny little boy. And I explained to him, that's not how it is. The court is this, this is, there's a judge, there is a lawyer, and how you are going to be asked questions. Once he got prepared, the second picture came out very appropriately right size. Each person was, the, there was judge, there was a lawyer, there he was, there was his, his mom. And that makes a big difference. And then after finishing, the, finishing his um, witness, uh, being on, I'm sorry, after being on his witness, Stand. He came out happily with extended hands. Dr. J, I did it. I did it. 
um, and this physical illness is another amazing. There are quite a few cases that I can describe here and we'll spend the whole day, but let's stay with one. Okay. Uh, so a child who was going to have open heart surgery because of congenital heart disease, he drew a picture for me where his body was literally cut into two pieces because open heart surgery, he expected the heart going to be pulled out. And I explained to him, after explaining the surgery itself, he became relieved and was very ready to go for surgery. These things are very helpful to the kids because we don't think that they think. And if you just tell them to be there, they will take it, but they are terrified, terrified. And this kind of help is very, very necessary and I enjoy doing that. Looks like uh, a child psychiatrist must have a lot of patience to deal with the patients. But looks like at the end of the day, you had a very rewarding career. I did. I did. Tell I me did. some of your greatest achievements and rewards that you have received. During, as I was treating different kinds of problems with the little children, I discovered there are certain situations or certain problems were not handled or not noted as problems, one of them being sexual abuse of children. In the earlier, just not recently, but in the 70s and 80s, there was no specialty as a specialization or problem even in the textbooks about sexual abuse of children. And it came into existence since we began. We, I consider my, my, myself as one of the pioneers of studying this, this problem. And those are the positive rewards. Those are the rewards that I would say. Um, and you, very recently a community gave me a very good honor because of the humanitarian and uh, work of lifetime relating to these issues, namely treating the victims of violence. Because I established s several programs. One of them was Brooklyn Family Center, that's in Brooklyn, Downstate Medical Center for child, child Abuse. And second is the Domestic Violence Related Program that is called Domestic Harmony Foundation. That's in Long Island. That is for the domestic violence women, essentially. So those are the rewards that I would, I consider as the real rewards. On behalf of Bollywood Talent Group, congratulations. Before we continue, now we bring another song by Kushalta. <laughs> once they start noticing behavior problem among the children, so the problem doesn't get too far in advance? Yes. The, it, the simple common sense thing that I would say is when the problem arises, it's too obvious for, the, for outsiders as well as the parents to see, notice. It's usually two ways parents deal with it either to overlook, there's nothing wrong, it'll, it's a phase, he'll be okay. 
or getting very anxious and talking to as many people as they can possibly get some feedback from. And that either confuses the issue and or gets the child angry for being exposed. The best way is to get to the professionals if the problem is continuous and cons persistent. And that's very important. If there's nothing wrong in talking to s some of your colleagues or friends, but no number of times you get very con conflicting advices, particularly, for example, in our community, talking to a psychiatrist is cons it's a big no-no. It's a stigma sometimes. It's very serious. So they would not go or consider take taking professional help. And that's wrong. When if it is needed, it must be done. It should be done. Because children do not outgrow anything. They may stop behaving in a certain way for the time being. But the trauma that has caused it or tr trigger that has caused the behavior to begin with will not just disappear. It will appear in an adult age or in different situations. And that's the danger. When a child is first brought to your office, does he or she willingly sit with you or you have to kind of go through an adjustment period? It depends. Some kids very readily walk in and start to talk to me because they would say, you know, because I, I tell mommy that she, she doesn't believe me. It's particularly sexual abuse cases or some other, particularly <laughs> adolescents who are stubbornly sitting there because they have been dragged by their mom to see the psychiatrist. And they will literally sit like this and refuse to talk. And there are very many ways to get them to talk. And that's the only way that you can let them connect with you. Otherwise, your sessions are wasted. And I have, when particularly a teenager sits there minute after minute after minute after minute, not saying a word. It's very frustrating, but you must bear with this silence. Usually, a number of times, they themselves get antsy and start to talk. Uh, I mean, examples I can give. You, you, you can, um, quick example, this girl would not talk to me. And then I said, oh, you know what, since you're not talking, I'm going to finish my work. And I, I started to write notes on my, my desk. She got very restless after some time. And then she said, do you have a dog? <laughs> because she <coughs> noticed a hair on the floor. Yeah, I do. And then we began. So as much as you feel frustrated about not being spoken to, you may do the same thing to the child and get get them back to you. So. And do the children prefer the parents to join during the counseling? No. Adolescents, no. They prefer to talk to me or talk to a therapist or physician by themselves. Because they always have tr trouble with what they think the parents are saying or doing against them. Because the feeling is that my mom just dragged me here and I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. And that's essentially, and most importantly, psychiatrist is an outsider and therefore neutral, essentially. We have no reason to judge before even knowing the child. Whereas at home, you bad boy, there, there's all this finger pointing and calling a bad name. And that's, that's why we are different than parents, and that's one of the reasons why they prefer talking to you directly and by yourself rather than talking to the, with the parents. This has been very enlightening indeed. What role do you think psychiatry should pay, play in the overall healthcare system? I wish that I could give you an answer that there is a big role, very huge role, is to be played by the psychiatrist. Because unfortunately, however, psychiatry is, gets a very end point or lower level on the totem pole of the phys uh, medical uh, health system. Simply because 
what psychiatrist does is not visible. What surgeon does, what other doctors do procedures, it's visible. And whereas the psychiatrist, what do they do? They, they just talk. They, it's, it's not, it's not, and the effects, when the surgeon cuts uh, uh, fixes the broken bone, it's visible. It was broken and it's fixed. But what psychiatrist does is very invisible. So we, it's not understood as essential, necessary, and useful. So I, I, and at the same time, people don't understand or don't realize if you are depressed, you will lose a lot of working hours, working days, whereas once your leg, bro broken leg is fixed, you're out there to, ready to work. And so the losses are major in psychiatry as compared to the other specialties. But so the role I would say is to getting involved in making the uh, changes in the system uh, and require, requiring uh, or making sure that mental health is really applied and used by majority of the in, in patients who require it. And that would be my my belief. I really do believe that. Okay. I really want to thank you for this very interesting and informative talk. Friends, we conclude today's program with another song by Kushal. just heard are solely those expressed by Dr. Kushalta Jaikar Amal. enjoyed this interview because I, I could express my thoughts about my profession and my work but more than that I also was happy to give or uh, happy for get, getting to sing out in the public which I don't do I never did and for that I'm thankful to Bollywood Talent Club. Thank you. <laughs>